Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, Primary Care and Specialty Care Providers now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana, siphysicians.org. The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching and learning in Indiana and around the world. More at education.indiana.edu. Main Source Bank, headquartered in Greensburg, Indiana, offering products and services to fit every stage of life. More information at mainsourcebank.com. Main Source, life needs a great bank. Member FDIC and equal housing lender. Smithville Fiber, the Gigacity Company, fiber internet, HD, and digital IPTV in southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. And by WTIU members, thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. The next phase of I-69 will impact a number of businesses, many of which who say they've already been hurt by ongoing construction delays. They need to make sure that, that this is a win-win situation for Martinsville and for the businesses that are, that are involved. What does the plan for Section 6 construction look like and where will the state find the money to pay for it? Plus, hundreds of people lined up to vote for directors to lead their electric co-op. Winners were announced, but almost immediately contested. Coming up, will the results stand? And a prison program to fix unwanted bikes is being called a win-win for the kids who receive the bikes and the offenders who repair them. The, the feeling of knowing that some child is happy somewhere to go get this bike. Those stories, plus the latest news headlines from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. The Indiana Department of Transportation says it should know by the first quarter of next year what the final stretch of Interstate 69 will look like. NDOT held two public hearings over the past week to get feedback on the proposed details of the project, which is projected to cut drive time from Martinsville to Indianapolis by 11 minutes. As Barbara Brozier reports, some are worried that convenience could come at a cost to their communities. Many of my concerns are when you're getting off this exit, are you going to have retail in this exit? Is there going to be room for retail? Bill Skillman has spent a lot of time poring over the details of this map. And as you can see with all the red dots, these are all businesses that are going away. Those red dots show potential buildings along the route for Interstate 69 from Martinsville to Indianapolis that will have to be moved to make way for the road. Section 6 will follow existing State Road 37, but additional room is needed to construct interchanges and overpasses and to widen the road to add more lanes. And that has Skillman worried beyond his own business. When you look at the setbacks, um, they get into our dealership, they get into a lot of the businesses. A lot of these businesses are going to be purchased and bought by the state. Skillman's Ford dealership sits on a prime piece of property along 37 in Martinsville. While current plans don't include relocating his business, several neighboring buildings are covered in those red dots. If you look at most automotive uh, areas, they seem to be clustered in areas. And I think it helps to, for a draw. You know, when you're just kind of out on an island, it's, uh, it's harder to get people to come to you. Skillman is one of several people who voiced his concerns during a public hearing in Martinsville earlier this week. It just seems to be real hodgepodge. There are 10 planned interchanges along Section 6 and 16 overpasses or underpasses. I think this is going to be a complete benefit to Martinsville. Mayor Shannon Cole says she's pleased with the proposal. It's going to um, provide connectivity for us, shorter times to get to downtown Indianapolis. We are right in between Indianapolis and Bloomington. It will allow us to capitalize on our location. Cole says she's already received inquiries from businesses outside of the community who are interested in coming to Martinsville because of I-69. And she's working with existing businesses that might have to relocate to come up with the best solution. We've made some progress by reaching out to them and business owners to 
hopefully try to see what their needs are and we're also updating our comprehensive plan for our city which so this is all perfect timing. Those businesses won't know INDOT's final plan for section 6 until the first quarter of next year. And those aren't the only details that remain up in the air. We're still looking for our funding source to fund the project uh, for construction. Uh, but once we get that record of decision from the Federal Highway Administration, that will hopefully shine some light on kind of what the next steps will be. INDOT's draft environmental impact statement says construction of Section 6 could cost one and a half billion dollars. The state paid for the other five sections of I-69 in a variety of ways. Money from the Indiana toll road lease covered the cost of the first three sections from Evansville to Crane. Indiana's gas tax paid for the majority of Section 4 from Crane to Bloomington. And Section 5 of the project, which is more than a year and a half behind schedule, is being funded through a public-private partnership. It's been a disaster. Skillman says construction delays on that project have impacted his business in Martinsville, so he's hoping the final leg of I-69 will be completed more quickly. I'd love to see it a, you know, a two shift a day, three shift a day, whatever it is to get the project done and keep businesses in business. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Barbara Brozier. NDOT is accepting public comments on the draft environmental impact statement through May 8th. The legislature will likely wrap up the 2017 session next week, so it's a race to the finish at this point. The governor has already signed around 80 pieces of legislation. Barbara Brozier joins us now to go through the bills. So let's talk about what bills are headed to the governor's desk. A bill that would ban sanctuary campuses at colleges and universities that accept federal or state dollars is awaiting Holcomb's signature. The move is largely symbolic because Indiana has no sanctuary campuses. Schools including Indiana University, the University of Notre Dame, and Ball State University have faced pressure from students and faculty but haven't taken action. At the heart of the pro-sanctuary movement, is concern about the fate of students who are unauthorized immigrants. The Senate sent a bill to the governor's desk that deals with parental notification of abortions. Girls under the age of 18 can go to court to get consent for abortion if their parents don't give that consent. Proposed legislation lets the judge decide whether to notify parents of the judicial hearing. Holcomb hasn't publicly taken a stance on the bill, so he could veto it or sign it. Another bill creates a charge for a public records request. The bill awaiting the governor's signature would allow governments to charge people as much as $20 an hour for public record searches if the request takes more than two hours to complete. Former Governor Mike Pence vetoed a similar measure two years ago. DNR officials say 2016 marked the deadliest year on record for ATV accidents, and legislators sent a bill to the governor's desk that is aimed at changing that. The bill requires anyone under 18 to wear a helmet when riding ATVs. An Indiana mom began pushing for the helmet legislation after her daughter died in an ATV accident in 2015. The bill that would reduce how much people are reimbursed for sending excess energy generated by solar panels or wind turbines back to the grid is heading to the governor's desk. Starting in 2022, new net metering customers would receive about 75% less for that excess energy. Solar advocates are urging Holcomb to veto the bill. Legislation allowing police to take DNA from anyone arrested for a felony is on its way to the governor's desk as well. Proponents of the measure argue that taking a DNA sample from an arrestee is the same thing as taking their mugshot or fingerprints. Road funding is among the bills that still has to be worked out. The House and the Senate each have a version. During testimony this week, John Thompson, who owns logistics, energy, and engineering companies in Indiana, says he supports the Senate's version, in particular, the $75 hybrid vehicle fee. All users should pay or we should attempt to get fair share from all users, and I'd add local and out of state. The Senate plan would generate around 800 million new dollars by 2021. The House plan, more than a billion new dollars. The House plan shifts the sales tax on gasoline entirely to pay for roads. The Senate's does not. And the Senate proposal spreads its 10 cent gas tax increase over two years. The House's does it all at once. House and Senate lawmakers will develop the bill's final form over the next week. 
Legislation making the state superintendent an appointed position is in limbo. Both the House and Senate sponsored bills this session to make the school's chief an appointed position. The House passed its version of the bill, but the Senate voted theirs down. Lawmakers had to significantly change the House bill to keep the issue alive, but now the bill is just sitting and the two chambers are at odds on how to move forward. The author of a bill barring local communities from banning short-term rentals such as Airbnb says negotiations must wrap up by Monday. The bill took direct aim at the city of Bloomington's proposed regulations for short-term rentals. City Council member Steve Bolin says the city wanted to bring short-term rentals in line with the city's long-term rental laws. We have the most stringent rental occupancy law in the state um, and we need it. You know, so if uh, people are going to do even shorter term rentals, well, those houses ought to be subject to at least similar restrictions. As it currently stands, the bill would limit rentals to no more than 30 days in a row and 180 days total in a year. It would also require owners to have liability insurance. And the state's biennial budget is still being debated in conference committee. You can look for more debate about whether to increase taxes, how much to pump into education, and fighting the state's growing drug epidemic. Of course, there are a lot more bills we don't have time for, but you can find an updated tracker on our website at WTIUnews.org. A non-toxic underwater adhesive could be used to address issues such as bone damage, dental work, and house construction. That's according to a researcher at Purdue University who is using Ocean Life to search for an answer. J.D. Gray reports. The first thing you might notice when you walk into the room is that it smells like salt water. Mussels and oysters are kept in temperature controlled tanks. These oysters come from South Carolina and those mussels come from Maine. Guess which one's in the warmer water and the colder water. You may notice the organisms are stuck together. Because one of the things that uh, the animals do particularly well that man-made adhesives do not do well is they can stick underwater. And when you go to the hardware store, if you buy all the adhesives there and you bring them home and try to glue things together in a bucket of water, nothing's going to work, right? Wilker says there are multiple reasons mussels might produce an adhesive. The adhesive protects them from waves, predators, and it helps with reproductive efficiency. What we're trying to do first is understand how nature makes materials. And so that involves working with these shellfish and looking at the adhesives they make. As we understand what the animals are doing, then we want to transition this technology into making synthetic versions of what the animals do. Wilker imagines uses that could include biomedical applications, and he tests the glue strength in his lab. This is what we have here. These are just a bunch of power tools, but basically what we're doing is we're uh, cutting up various types of tissue, so bones and, and soft tissue, and, and gluing it together and, and trying to, to test uh, how good our adhesives are. And then uh, in the other room we have a machine, we'll pull them apart and test the adhesion strength. We have not solved the biomedical adhesive problem yet, but we're making, I think, uh, some very good progress and we've got some materials that are, that are sticking pretty well. Wilker says a recent adhesive made by the lab turned out to be more than 10 times stronger than the adhesive produced by the muscles. For Indiana News Desk, I'm J.D. Gray. Wilker says the lab recently created another adhesive that is made from corn. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. A program helps prisoners learn job skills and gives bicycles to needy kids and families. And join me on a drive around the city in an Indy race car. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. We are a nation of explorers. We seek new ways of living, of thinking, and of expressing ourselves. We take risks. We learn from experience and we keep moving forward. That's why we encourage and celebrate the explorer in all of us. Ten thousand. Fifteen? Fifteen, do you think? Twenty. Twenty-one thousand? Six hundred. Twenty. Eighteen five. Twenty-four. It's at least forty. Look, yeah, look at 4, it. Forty-five hundred thousand. Six fifty. Twenty. Six fifty. This textile would be worth about a half a million dollars. Half a million? No way! 
idea. I knew it. It's just a blanket. It's laying on the back of a chair. Well, sir, you have a national treasure. Wow. A national treasure. Congratulations. I can't believe this. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. To catch us up on news headlines from across the state, Barbara Brozier joins us again. She has the latest on this week's top stories. Thanks, Joe. Three new faces are joining the board at the Utilities District of Western Indiana. More than a thousand people voted in Saturday's election. UDWI customers had the highest electricity rate in the state last year. And David Berger, Todd Carpenter, and John Royal ran as the change candidates against incumbents Jack Nust, Jim Weimer, and David Stone. Three petitions were filed challenging Carpenter's win over 27-year board member Weimer. After investigating, the voting committee determined last night Carpenter's win stands. The new board meets for the first time April 27th. A chemical spill from U.S. Steel is causing beaches to close along Dunes National Lakeshore. The spill contains a toxic industrial byproduct, which is a carcinogen and can cause skin irritation. Three beaches closed Thursday. Environmental advocates say the spill shows the need to preserve federal support for the Great Lakes, such as funding for the EPA. We need these agencies to help identify issues like this, get the information to the public, and help keep our waters safe. The EPA says preliminary data suggests the chemical is not present near drinking water intakes. The agency is awaiting final results from about 200 samples. Well, the EPA and the mayor of East Chicago remain at a standstill over the future of the lead-contaminated West Calumet neighborhood. Mayor Anthony Copeland wants the EPA to clean the area to a residential stand standard. But last July, the mayor ordered the residences be torn down, and the EPA says it doesn't know for sure if the land will be used for housing. The EPA says it wants to see a plan from the mayor before moving forward. The truck driver who caused a historic Paoli bridge to collapse must surrender herself to the Orange County Jail by Wednesday. A judge this week gave Mary Lambright the maximum sentence of 180 days after she pleaded guilty to reckless driving in several infractions. With good behavior, she could serve only half that time. Lambright drove a 30-ton semi over the bridge even though it had a 6-ton weight limit. Lambright apologized during her sentencing hearing, calling it a terrible mistake, but the judge says her actions were reckless, not negligent. A grant from the Richard Fairbanks Foundation will attempt to fill a significant need for workers trained in addiction treatment. More than 1,200 Hoosiers died in 2015 as a result of the opioid epidemic. The Fairbanks Foundation is giving a $376,000 grant to develop a new model for training social workers specializing in substance abuse. The goal is to train up to 50 licensed professionals each year. Engineering firms bidding to make repairs at the Greensburg Courthouse will face an unusual problem. As Lindsay Wright reports, the task is how to preserve a precarious tree and a piece of city history. Perched 110 feet above the city square is Greensburg's iconic white mulberry tree. It gives us an identifying factor in our advertising and um, over the years we've become known as a tree city. City officials suspect nature planted the original seed in the 1870s by either wind or bird. However, the 50-year-old tree that hugs the clock tower now is a direct descendant. As seeds from the tree become wedged in the porous limestone, saplings develop. These saplings are then maintained by the city in case the parent tree dies, so there's always a tree on the courthouse roof. But the limestone shingles on which the tree grows are crumbling. There's pieces falling off, and the higher it is, the, the, the harder it hits when it falls. Braces have been installed to slow down the corrosion, but Chadwell says a complete repair is now in order. City leaders will decide on a bid May 1st in hopes to begin repairs soon. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Lindsay Wright. Calling her the embodiment of true compassion, the governor yesterday bestowed the state's highest honor upon Holocaust survivor Eva Kaur. She is the living embodiment of true compassion. Her life proves there are no bounds on forgiveness, on human decency. 
This is the first time Holcomb presented the Sachem Award. It's given to recognize accomplishment and moral virtue. Core founded the Children of Auschwitz Nazi Deadly Lab Experiment Survivors Museum in Terre Haute in 1985 and has since championed forgiveness for the Holocaust atrocities. She spoke to a crowd of a couple hundred. I am trying to teach the world to heal through forgiveness. I am asking every single one of you to join me and the governor in, in this much needed endeavor. The 83-year-old Jewish native of Romania was sent in 1944 to the Auschwitz concentration camp, where most of her family was killed. Cor and her twin sister survived, but were subjected to inhumane medical experiments before their liberation in 1945. To go through all of that and dedicate her life to sharing the stories of other survivors and those who perished, it's pretty amazing. And I believe you can check the website for her schedule and able to meet her there at the Candles Absolutely. Museum. Absolutely. She's still very involved there. Unbelievable. Thanks, Barbara. And Indiana Prison is engaging offenders by offering a program that trains them to repair bicycles. The Putnamville Correctional Facility gathers used bikes and unwanted bikes from across the state. Prisoners repair the bikes, then they're sent back to charity groups. WTIU's James Vavrick has the story. A warehouse at the Putnamville Correctional Facility is cluttered with broken bicycles. Off to the side, a handful of inmates are focused on repairing the bikes in front of them. The brakes are tightening up on me for no reason at all. Charles Holmes has been here for several years and says tinkering with the bikes helps him pass the time. Since I was a kid, I liked to take things apart and put them back together, but as I got toward my adult years, I kind of slacked off and, you know, done it as a pastime and never really was into it as much, but actually doing this has brought me back, brought the feeling back. These used bikes are getting a second life through a community effort going on in Indianapolis. Bicycle Garage Indy owns multiple bike shops throughout the city. While you can shop for new bicycles at these stores or fix up your own bike, they also serve as a drop-off point for unwanted bicycles. We take in bikes year-round at all three of our Bicycle Garage Indy stores. And several times throughout the year, the group holds collection events around the metro area. Schmucker says it's a way to promote the program and gather more abandoned bicycles. A lot of the people who get the bikes, it is their main means of transportation. It's a critical thing for them to have and it really has changed their lives. After they're donated, the bikes are loaded into a truck and Bicycle Garage employees take them to a warehouse to assess the damage. They're sorted and then the majority of them are sent to Putnamville for repairs. They take them there, people can donate their bikes all there, and then after they go through them a little bit, then they send them down to us. We make sure everything's good, repair them if they need repaired, uh, check them over, and we send them back out to groups and charities. Some of the repairs are minor and can be completed in a few hours. Others are more complicated and can take a while to fix. Last year, inmates repaired about 700 bicycles. That's more than double the previous year when they fixed 300. Their goal is really ambitious this year, 1,000 bikes. The work is meaningful for the prisoners. After the bikes leave here, they're donated to underprivileged children. The, the feeling of knowing that some child is happy somewhere to go get this bike. So I have my own and they, they, they can show off to their friends, this is mine. And, you know, I, I feel good knowing that somewhere some child is doing it and I have a part in it. In the 10 years since these programs have started, nearly 4,000 bicycles have been distributed. Moss says compassion fuels their efforts. It may not seem like it, but if you read the letters and you see the faces that we take these bikes to and uh, all that, it, there's a lot of compassion involved in that. For Indiana News Desk, I'm James Vavrick. Now Charles Holmes has ended his sentence at Putnamville since we last spoke with him. He said his immediate plans after getting out were to find two jobs, which he thinks may include repairing bicycles or automobiles. And that is certainly one of the goals of the program, to help offenders develop useful job skills so they can increase their chances of success when they're released from prison. Representatives from the Indianapolis 500 were in Bloomington Thursday hyping up the concert lineup at the track's Snake Pit by giving out indie car rides, and I joined in on the fun. We're just giving people a little taste of the indie car series yeah. and what the cars sound like and look like. So this thing is fully street legal. We can ride around campus, 
rev it up, get people excited. This actually used to be a real IndyCar that they raced in the series, um, and then they modified it. They stretched it out an extra 40 inches to accommodate a second seat so we could do rides. So it's got treaded tires. It's actually got a license plate underneath the rear wing there. And the top speed of this one um, is about 130 miles an hour just because it's limited. You sit right down in the same position a real race driver would sit in. So it's a new thing that most people haven't experienced actually sitting down in a race car cockpit. Yeah, my family is a big uh, racing family and uh, always uh, we're, um, my dad was a sprint car driver. Uh, I'm excited. Um, we'll see how fast he gets me up going and, and me and my friends, but it's going to be quite an experience. This year will mark the 101st running of the annual car race. The race takes place on May 28th. Just to be clear, I didn't take photos and drive at the same time. There was a driver. It was a lot of fun. That's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, primary care and specialty care providers now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana, siphysicians.org. The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching and learning in Indiana and around the world. More at education.indiana.edu. Main Source Bank, headquartered in Greensburg, Indiana, offering products and services to fit every stage of life. More information at mainsourcebank.com. Main Source, life needs a great bank. Member FDIC and equal housing lender. Smithville Fiber, the Gigacity Company. Fiber internet, HD, and digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. And by WTIU members, thank you.